Hi! Welcome to today's episode and I would say this is kind of like a sequel to yesterday's episode because I'm still going to talk about GI uh, but today we're going to focus a bit more on uh, the different scenarios that you observe in GI as well as the different uh, common variables that you will find in GI examinations and hopefully this will help you better prepare for your O or N level examinations that's coming up really soon. Okay, so without further ado, let's start with Coast GI. So for Coast GI, there are a couple of common scenarios that you will find. So first of all, you have longshore drift, you have beach profile, you have sediment size, you have sediment angularity. Now this is a little bit uncommon but good to know. And then you have effectiveness of coastal protection measures. So all these different scenarios require different variables. And um, now for longshore drift, uh, the common variables will include things like wind speed, wind direction, the distance traveled by the sediment along a beach so once you have um, an idea that the question is actually asking you about longshore drift it is important that you understand the different steps that the students can take to actually collect the data for this longshore drift experiment now um, common mistake that I noticed among students would be that they were able to use their own words to describe the entire process of data collection but there's always the lack of the use of precise geographical terms so what I mean by this is that let's visualize if you are doing the actual experiment of longshore drift basically you have an orange or a tennis ball or something that's buoyant and now you first mark out the start point using a ranging pole and then you toss the orange or the tennis ball into the sea and then you observe its movement for a fixed duration such as 10 minutes and then after that you actually mark off the end point with a ranging pole and you measure the distance but um common mistake would be that they do not use geographical terms like the students will toss the orange into the swash zone. Now, the word swash zone itself is actually important because you have to show the marker that you're aware it is the swash action and the backwash action that actually moves the sediment. So if I just simply toss it into the open sea, what if I toss it beyond the swash zone? Basically, longshore drift would not be observed. So number one would be the precise use of geographical graphical terms and number two would be the use of instruments. Now you have to mention what instruments the students are actually using in this investigation. So for instance if they are observing the movement of the orange for 10 minutes you got to use a stopwatch and if you are measuring the distance between the two ranging poles you got to use a measuring tape. So instruments are important in this case because you tell the marker that you are aware of what instruments the students are actually preparing prior to the entire investigation. So just take note of these two main points and you should be good to go. Alright, so next would be beach profile or beach gradient. Now the common variables that you will notice in this case would be sediment size as well as wave energy. So something like a hypothesis that says uh, a beach with larger sediment size will have a steeper beach profile. One thing to note is that um, you got to first look at the photographs that are provided in the question context because uh, if the photograph actually show a beach that has consistent gradient um, then ideally when you're placing the ranging pole it should be done at equal intervals of let's say two meters or five meters but if you get a photograph that shows that the beach has very um, sudden changes in the gradient itself um, then in this case the way you place the ranging pole shouldn't be at a fixed interval but instead it should be placed where there are sudden changes in the gradient okay so that's one thing to note and after that basically the rest of the steps should be quite straightforward and I will move on to the next one which is slightly more interesting and it's about sediment size now when we talk about sediment size um, the common variables will include beach gradient wave energy, distance from low water mark as well as distance from the cliff. So a typical guiding question in this case can be how does the sediment size vary with distance from the low water mark? Now in this case, you got to first lay down a line of transect from the low water mark to the back of the beach using a measuring tape and then uh, mark out equal intervals of let's say 3 meters or 5 meters and at each interval, you're supposed to place a quadrant 
and then you randomly or systematically select the sediment and then you use a vernier caliper to measure the longest axis and then you repeat this at every interval. Now sounds straightforward but before you even conduct this investigation, good to first notice what kind of beach this particular um, experiment is actually conducted on because for instance if you are conducting this experiment on a pebbled beach then ideally you can use vernier caliper but think about this in the context of a sandy beach do you use vernier caliper for measuring the longest axis of a sand so in this case the students should actually be using sieves at each interval to determine the proportion of the different types of sediment that's found at a particular interval and they repeat this at every interval okay so um, good to note which type of beach uh, this is actually conducted on okay so next we have sediment angularity now this is uncommon like i said but um, a typical Typical variable that you can actually expect from this would be wave energy. So a uh, hypothesis can be something like the greater the wave energy, the more angular the sediments. Now think about this, if we are looking at angularity of sediments, obviously you have to compare the sediment that you have collected with a chart or with a scale. Now in this case you can look at power's scale of roundness, it is basically a scale that you can compare the angularity of the sediment with to determine whether it is very angular angular or is it very rounded. So sediment angularity it's also something that you should consider and do not just glance through and not pay attention to it. Now next we have effectiveness of coastal protection measures. Now uh, this is something that is very interesting because it's usually done with a bipolar survey but um, common thing that students tend to not pay attention to would be who are the people they are surveying because it should be done with the locals who have stayed there for a long period of time um, so much so that they could actually tell whether the coastal protection measure has been effective or not in promoting their position or in reducing the rate of erosion okay all right next we have tourism gi so when it comes to tourism gi like i've mentioned in yesterday's video uh, there are a couple of typical investigations that can be conducted so things like looking at traffic count or land use survey or bipolar survey to look at environmental or cultural perception and lastly of course the use of questionnaire to test out various variables such as tourist profile distance of the country of origin of the tourist uh, reasons for visiting the particular site, the length of stay in the particular country, as well as the economic impact of tourism on locals. Now, let's just focus on traffic count. So when it comes to traffic count, do take note of the instrument that's used. It is actually a tally counter or you can call it a clicker. Basically, it helps to ensure accuracy of the data and then where the students are going to position themselves either at the entrance or the exit to prevent double counting to ensure reliability and um, yeah that's about it so um, use tally method in the table to record down the data and then when you present it it can either be in the form of a line graph or a bar graph or even pie chart <sighs> Okay, next we have land use survey. Now, land use survey is useful especially if you want to show the different types of services or facilities or amenities that are available on uh, a particular stretch of uh, street itself. Um, and you can actually look at the proportion of the different types of businesses that are conducted along the street. Um, so, when you are doing the investigation, good to know where is your start point, where is your end point, and um, after you have collected the data, you have to categorize them with different categories and make sure that the categories are not too broad, so much so that um, certain shops can actually fall under two different categories and it will be very confusing when you're analyzing the data. Okay, next we have bipolar survey. This is usually associated with environmental as well as cultural perception. So people's perspective of the environmental condition of the particular site. So you might get um, aspects such as amount of litter, the amount of noise, um, or things like the condition of the infrastructure, So or, or even how crowded the area is. All this falls under environmental aspects. So 
when you're collecting the data, you can use tally method as well. And when you are presenting the data, it will be in a bipolar graph, which basically looks like a bar graph. Um, so when uh, you're conducting bipolar survey, good to consider the sample size, the sampling method, etc. So it's similar to that of a questionnaire. And now when it comes to a questionnaire, sometimes it's good to first consider the use of a pilot survey before you actually conduct the actual questionnaire on site because a pilot survey will actually give the students the feedback about the feasibility of the actual survey itself so that they can make the amendments before they actually collect the data on site. So when you're conducting questionnaire, a couple of things to consider would be where the students are going to position themselves, ideally scatter themselves throughout the entire site Site. They need not conduct it at the same time because uh, the response is not time dependent. And um, yeah, what kind of sampling method they're going to use. Um, and then the sample size should be big enough to ensure reliability. And of course, the questions that they ask are they double barreled uh, or the questions they ask are they relevant to the aim of the GI itself. So when they're presenting the data itself, it would usually be bar graph or pie chart or scatter graph because the data is actually categorical data. Okay, so lastly, we have weather and climate GI and I guess weather and climate GI, the best part of it is that it is very straightforward. It's usually about relationship uh, between the various variables such as temperature or temperature range, uh, rainfall, wind speed, wind direction, relative humidity as well as cloud cover. Now, the important thing to note would be which type of instrument you are using, especially for temperature. If you're looking at the temperature range, then you have to specify that you're using maximum minimum thermometer. And then if you're measuring the rainfall, then you have to use a rain gauge. How do you actually use the rain gauge? How do you ensure accuracy of the data? You should ensure that it's placed in an open field um, with little obstruction. And then um, basically when you collect the data itself, you also have to make sure that uh, you read off the reading without a parallax error to ensure accuracy. So all those are the little things that you have to take note of when you're revising uh, for weather and climate GI. And then wind speed, you use an anemometer. And then wind direction, you will use a handheld wind vane. So you have to put it at one arm's length and then you have to note that the arrow will be pointing towards where the wind is blowing from. So um, yeah, next would be relative humidity. You use a sling psychrometer. So if you are using a sling psychrometer, you got to take note that um, you have to swing it uh, for one minute at a consistent rate. And then how do you read off the reading and you have to match it with a table. So all those are little things that you should always be careful with. So basically when you're talking about weather and climate GI, very important to specify which instrument they're using and go through step by step um, and also think about how can the students increase the accuracy of the data as well as the reliability of the data. And lastly, we have cloud cover. Now, this is something that's observed. So it's true observation. And if you want to increase reliability of your data, good to take photographs so that you can enhance the validity of your conclusion after you are done with your GI. Okay, so I have just finished explaining some of the things to consider the context as well as the variables that you will observe for all three different types of GI. So I hope this video is beneficial to you, especially in your revision. And yeah, let me know if you have any questions and I wish you all the best in your revision and see you again soon. Bye.